Sure. Sure. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, it's always nice to come along and speak to 50 people. It's nice for a number of reasons. I think the most important is that being a libertarian activist is rather a lonely activity nowadays. <laughs> there are not that many of us. There never have. There never has been that many of us. Um, but there was a time when we could think that other people were listening to us, whereas the history of the past 10 years has shown very conclusively that uh, nobody very much is listening to us and nobody in power is listening to us. I I'm minded of um, one of Murray Rothbard's epigrams. Why is it that no one important is our friend? And, and the answer is because the moment the, the moment they become important, they stop being our friends. <laughs> now, one of the temptations of not having many political friends is that we often tend to stop being libertarians all the time, and we look at other aspects of our identity. And one of the one of the unifying bonds between libertarians and conservatives and people on the wider right is a deep hostility to the European Union. That is a hostility that I fully share, indeed for the avoidance of doubt. I should say that 20 years ago I ran a campaign called the Candid List. I won't go into the details of what I did, but this contributed in a small but possibly significant way to the pressure under which David Cameron felt obliged to call the referendum in, in the first place. But uh, let, me, let me say something about where we stand at the moment with regard to the debate on Europe. I've heard much abuse of Parliament and of politicians in general, and again, for the avoidance of doubt, I, have, um, I do not for a moment dispute that most politicians are living filth and that <laughs> probably all members of Parliament should be fitted with exploding collars. But, uh, when I look at the, when I look at the present chaos in Parliament, what strikes me most about it is that for the first time in my life, indeed for the first time in a very, very long time, Parliament appears to be doing its job. Three years ago, we voted to leave the European Union. It was not a colossal majority in favour of leaving. We were on 52 to 48 which means that the 52 must get their way, but the 48 must be taken into account. And the government was tasked with the job of getting us out of the customs union, of the European Union, and uh, making us a sovereign nation state once again. And <coughs> Theresa May promised that she would do this, and so for the next two years and six months, she continued promising that uh, everything was on target and we'd be deeply impressed. Then last November, she published the withdrawal agreement, or rather the European Commission, since he wrote the thing, published the withdrawal agreement, which was for reasons I do not need to explain to anyone in this room, a deeply unsatisfactory document. And when this was presented to the House of Commons, it was rejected. Quite rightly, the members of Parliament had a plain public duty to reject this withdrawal agreement because it was not a withdrawal agreement. And it, indeed, it combined all of the worst elements of remaining in the European Union with none of the advantages of being outside the European Union. And so, what have the politicians done that is so wrong? They've rejected this. It is their job. The problem 
is that Theresa May, and she is the villain of this piece, she is the main villain, she is perhaps the only <coughs> one, she made sure that there was no plan B. Parliament rejected the withdrawal agreement, and the members of Parliament said, right, so what's next? To which Theresa May said, well, you've rejected the withdrawal agreement, so here is the withdrawal agreement. Again, <laughs> <laughs> and Parliament rejected it. And, and after that, some of the politicians said, well, you know, we'll take over, we'll take charge. But of course you cannot expect the House of Commons to do the job of the executive. The House of Commons does not have the considerable intelligence and diplomatic resources of the executive. The fact remains that there was no plan B. The government had spent nearly three years <coughs> doing nothing. Uh, and why should the members of Parliament be able to agree on their own plan to leave the European Union? I agree that many of them would like to remain. But e even leaving that aside, and even leaving aside the generally low moral and intellectual quality of the members of Parliament, I, I don't see how they could be expected to come up with their own scheme of leaving. This is, this is a fiasco which can be laid entirely at the door of Theresa May. And the, Not, government, and the government. And the government. But then again, Theresa May is the government. She, she's, ran, she, she's run the government in the most Stalinist way since she took over. And, and she, did, she legitimized that by saying that Brexit means Brexit and no deal is better than a, a bad deal. Now, uh, I, I grant that the, politi that the members of Parliament should not perhaps have insisted on taking uh, no deal off the table, but no deal has not been taken off the table legally. The government doesn't want it, that's quite plain. But um, let me say this. Although I, I don't think that if we left without a deal, there'd be Operation Stack all the way to Birmingham, there would, bearing in mind that no contingency planning has been made, there would be potentially severe short-term disadvantages to leaving without a deal. And so the members of parliament, without the special knowledge that the executive can be presumed to have, is rightly skeptical of the possibility of leaving without a deal. And so we have chaos in parliament. Nobody wants to, t well, there's not a majority for cancelling withdrawal, there's not a majority for leaving without a deal, there's not a majority for Theresa May's withdrawal agreement. And it is all the fault of Theresa May. It is not the fault of the members of Parliament. They have been doing their job, which is to hold the executive to account and to reject executive proposals which are not remotely in the public interest. Now this brings me on, this brings me back to the matter of being a lonely libertarian activist looking for friends. While we have been obsessing over the matter of whether and how to leave the European Union, the, 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 the police state in this country has continued to grow. We have age verification for looking at pornographic websites. I'm sure there are people in this room who would say, pornography disgusting. Well, perhaps it is. My dear friend, my late friend Chris would have told you, no, it's not disgusting. Pornography is wonderful. I like it. My wife likes it. My girlfriend likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone remember that? <laughs> no, it's important. It, it's very important. Uh, Swithin has mentioned the prevent strategy, which has imposed uh, something like an internal police state on the British education system. Now, now since I happen to be inside this system at the moment, and since I do have a small part in the prevent strategy, I can't say too much about it. Perhaps I said more already, because it is a nasty and a frightening thing which is being used to shut down any attempt at 
originality and individuality within the education system. There are numerous other internal police states for the administration of this country, most of which don't get into the newspaper. There is the uh, there's, there's European Union's proposal that um, all cars should be fitted with speed inhibitors and black boxes from 2022. And I've no doubt the British government will sign up to that whether we're in or out of the European Union. There, there, there is the European Union's copyright directive, which was agreed the other day, which may, it's very hard to say with regard to these things, which may have very serious consequences on the free movement of information through the internet. There is a police state growing in this country. And let me go further. Let me say that a lot of this police state has nothing whatever to do with the European Union. A, a lot of this is purely homegrown, or rather it is it is a matter of the English-speaking world. Some year, many years ago, the, the government changed the law to abolish the uh, double jeopardy rule in, in murder trials. There were many people at the time who said, oh, this is all part of the European Union's sinister corpus juris, which wants to abolish our wonderful common law and replace it with Napoleonic civil law. I, I might have been inclined to go along with that, it's just that I do tend to keep an eye on the developments in this country and across the world. And I noticed that uh, the Australian states, the individual states in Australia plus the federal government, adopted a similar abolition of the double jeopardy rule in murder cases and used exactly the same wording in its acts of parliament as our own government did. The, 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 abolition of double, the abolition of the double jeopardy rule had nothing whatever to do with the European Union. And when, when you look at a whole range of things, the disarmament of the population, gun control is not a European Union issue. Gun control is a British and a British Commonwealth um, initiative. The, there are many parts of the, there are many countries in the European Union where you can walk into the police station, pay a, pay a small clerking fee, and walk out with a gun license. You can do that in Slovakia. <laughs> you can do it in the Czech Republic. Indeed, in the Czech Republic a few years ago, the president went on television and, and told his people the best way to avoid terrorist atrocities is if you carry your guns with you in public. Now, the Czech Republic is right at the heart of Europe. There are very, I don't believe, apart from possibly the Republic of Ireland, which is also an English-speaking country, I don't believe there is another European state which has such paranoid and obsessive laws against the civilian ownership of firearms as the United Kingdom. Do not try to blame the European <coughs> Union for having turned us into disarmed slaves. The European Union is not hugely interested in the money laundering regulations. I, I've had a few brushes, or rather I've had some experience of the money laundering rules over the past few years. They are much, much more intrusive in this country than in any other member state of the European Union. This is a British and an English-speaking matter. And so, yes, let us be against the European Union. There are many bad things about the European Union, not least the fact that it blurs lines of accountability so that our own ruling class is able to pass off its own oppressions as things required by those awful Europeans. Mm. Well, let us detach ourselves from those probably not so awful Europeans so that the next time something beastly is done to us, we can point at the villains in Westminster and say, why are you, why are you doing this to us? Of course, it has something to do with making sure that British laws are made by British politicians in Britain, accountable to British people. But from a libertarian point of view, it must be purely about 
clarifying the lines of accountability so that if you ask the question, who is my master, we can answer, that scumbag over there. <laughs> he or she is our master. Let us do something about him or her. And let us pull him down and replace him with someone slightly less awful, r rather than be ha having this blurry target that fills up an entire wall. Uh, that, that would be a libertarian case against the European Union. And in making that case, we should not become too obsessed about Europe. Europe is not the only oppressive force in this country. Indeed, Europe may not by any means be the worst oppressive force in this country. I now come to the advertised title of my talk, which is about the alt right. And let me come back to where I began. We do not have that many political friends. There are not that many of us. And over the past decade or so, we have found ourselves in conversations of various kinds with um, certain elements of what is called the alternative right, the alt-right, the um, dissident right, mm. <coughs> what some people call the far right, you, you name it, we find ourselves in conversation with these people. And let, let me say immediately that we do have an overlap of concerns. The things that we complain about, they complain about as well. We both complain about an overmighty state an overmighty state run by people who appear to be either evil or clinically insane or who are both. Uh, an overmighty state which fights wars of aggression uh, and atrocity elsewhere in the world for reasons which are never clearly explained to us. An overmighty state which quite evidently would like to join up with other of the mighty states to impose an overall global government on humanity. This has long been an obsession of libertarians, and this is an obsession of many people on the alt-right. We start with much the same kind of analysis. I could go further. There are some people in the alternative right who speak of themselves as contingent libertarians. They do not, as a matter of principle, believe in freedom of speech and freedom of association and um, a strict limitation of government. Uh, they are often quite honest that if they ever come to power, these things will be regarded as very much secondary to the overarching need to create uh, their kind of society. But since they are not in power, and are not likely to come to power in the foreseeable future, and, and since they are oppressed by laws against freedom of speech and freedom of association, then they regard themselves as contingent or conditional libertarians. They believe in freedom of speech at the moment, so long as their freedom of speech is being infringed. They believe in freedom of association at the moment, so long as it is their freedom of association that is being infringed. And as good libertarians, naturally, we defend their right to freedom of speech and their right to freedom of association. And I'm not saying this simply as um, an act of bravado. I have spent many years I spent the first, the first half of my life as a libertarian, I spent <coughs> defending various kinds of sex maniac, and the second half of my life as a libertarian, defending various kinds of white nationalist and Nazi. I have always been an equal opportunity libertarian. <laughs> 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 but although we're all civilized men and women, and although we can sit down and we can discuss our various differences and our shared points of view, something that we must never forget is that we begin from different premises and we want to go in different directions. 
Speaking as a libertarian, oh, that's a terrible phrase, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it, it is a relevant one. Speaking as a libertarian, I want to live in a world inhabited by a single human race which is united in a common passion for progress. I regard the world as a giant treasure house of resources which it is our right and our duty to exploit, to improve and to lengthen our lives. And I look forward to an indefinite scientific and technical and economic progress, a line which for the past few hundred years has been turning very nicely up to turn almost vertical and take us into a science <coughs> future. In depth of life expansion, extension, colonies on the moon and inner planets, the mining of the asteroid belts, the building of a Dyson sphere around our sun. That is the future that I, as a libertarian, want. When I look at many of the um, core ideological works of the alt-right, I'm appalled. Not, not because they are evil in a very real sense, but because they are, if you'll pardon the vulgarity, piss poor. <laughs> Has anyone ever read Julius Ebler? Has anyone ever yes. read Oswald Spengler? Has anyone, anyone read Savitra Devi? Or <laughs> Alistair Crowley? Or <laughs> Francis Parker Yockey? Of these people. It really is dire stuff. Um, look, I, I have the greatest imaginable admiration for the Germans. When it comes to music, or things like aspirin and heroin and BMW cars. I adore the Germans, but this alt-right philosophy is Germanic in the worst possible sense. It's just great clouds of opaque hot air. I look at this stuff, volume after volume after volume of it, and most of it's now freely available on the internet, which saves me the trouble of buying it, because I wouldn't read if I had to buy it. I, I look at this stuff and I tell myself, you know, probably a, a single railway bridge built by Brunel has given more solid improvement to humanity than the entire mass of what the alt-right considers its core ideological texts. So, when it comes to making friends, yes, we are rather friendless. And of course, when people reach out to us and smile at us and pat us on the back and say, we agree with you, we, we, you know, we really regard ourselves as just like you in many respects. And when you find on reading their, their more journalistic works that they are complaining about much the same things as we are, and indeed, if I go further, when you find that they share a, a common initial analysis with us, there is a very great temptation to, if I say get into bed with them, I might be, I might be using the an entirely appropriate phrase. There is a temptation to regard them not merely as partial allies, but as our close working friends. Uh, and I do suggest that they are not and should not be regarded as our close working friends, not at least if we are speaking as libertarians. As libertarians, we are in favour of life, liberty and property. Life, liberty and property for the whole of humanity. It may be it may be that um, on our passage towards a fuller appreciation of life, liberty and property, a number of short-term compromises need to be made. But this does not stop us from being libertarians and should not persuade us that we are long-term travellers with people whose ideologies are fundamentally different from our own.
And so, what, what do I suggest? By all means, let us denounce Theresa May. She deserves it. Ne never mind the European business. She is a fascist beast. <laughs> and if she leaves office broken in body and spirit, I shall not spend a moment feeling sorry for her. I, I will not even shed the occasional hypocritical tear as she drops dead six months after leaving office. <laughs> and let's crucify her because of the European issue. She has betrayed us. She's broken every promise she made. She did so deliberately. I don't know if she is stupid or simply wicked, but there is a point at which stupidity on that scale becomes wickedness. Uh, so I, I won't argue between stupid and wicked. Let us, let, let, let us involve ourselves in the European issue because it is something that concerns us. It is something that is rightfully of interest to us. <coughs> Not, not just as libertarians, but as ordinary men and women in this country. But let us at the same time remember that the European Union is not the only and may not be the main violator of life, liberty and property. And that at all times, our own state <coughs> is that violator. A, a state which for some reason we want to be made absolutely sovereign over us. I can understand the judgment we're making because I, I share it. I'm making that judgment. I'm taking quite a big risk, as indeed are we all. Let us by all means defend the rights of any group that is marginalized and demonized and oppressed. And I would add in this, not just the old right people, but also the Muslims. They have a thoroughly bad time in this country. I, I know that, again, there's a cottage industry on the right um, devoted to explaining that we're about to become some Sharia hellhole. But if you speak to most Muslims, they're, they're rather concerned about what is being done to their children and the levels of surveillance under which they operate. Remember that Anjan Chowdhury, a most wicked man, I have no doubt, was put in prison, not for, uh, not for committing anything that would have been a crime when I was young, but simply for saying <coughs> things. He went to prison for speaking his mind. <coughs> Uh, and, and that is something that we should also um, we, we should also keep that in our heads. So let us defend the rights of the oppressed. Let us, where it is appropriate, be polite to those who are oppressed, and let us sit down and have an intelligent conversation. But remember that the main purpose of having intelligent conversation with these people is to make libertarians of them not to make ourselves into what they are. And let us not forget that we, that our ideology is highly distinct and individual. It is about, it is about life, liberty, and property. A libertarian is somebody who wants to be left alone, who wants to leave others alone, and who wants other people to leave other people alone. <clears throat> Everything else beyond that is a matter of <coughs> detail and footnotes. And it is not the same as the fundamental <coughs> principles of certain other movements with which we may have polite discussions. So with that, I'll thank you for your patience. How long have I had, Kian? Well, I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs>